To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, visit gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Programming languages can sometimes feel a little incomprehensible. It's like when you're learning a new human language and you want to ask something a little weird, like, is that mouse radioactive? But all you can come up with is basically, glow, small rat, yeah? But with practice and an ever-growing Java toolkit, we can communicate well enough to get a computer to do exactly what we want. And we'll start to see that the exact same instructions can be communicated in simpler and more convenient ways. For instance, part of the power of computers is how efficiently they handle the mind-numbing, repetitive tasks that would take us humans forever and that we would almost certainly mess up. So we basically want one piece of code over and over again. Technically, we could accomplish that by copying and pasting that piece of code however many times we want. It's super clunky and hurts my soul, but it does the job. But to make our program simpler and way easier to write and interpret, we can use the magic of loops. In our episode on while loops, we learned how to repeat actions with conditional statements. But if we want just straight up, no strings attached repetition, the for loop might be the hero we need. I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, code and programming for beginners. In a computer program, loops are one of the most common ways that we can repeat a set of instructions. They are super powerful, which is why it might sound like I'm on a bit of a loop and keep talking about them in so many episodes. And technically, anything that can be done with a for loop can be done with a while loop, but they both have their strengths and weaknesses. While loops are great when you don't know exactly how many times the loop will run, but you have some specific logic that helps determine when the loop needs to stop. Like, say we have a program that calculates the number of cups of coffee someone can make with a certain amount of ground beans. Now, I'd say probably not enough cups, but hey, I'm not a computer. I just have a caffeine problem. We can use a scanner to get user input that's saved to a double variable named grams of coffee. And we want to make sure that the user puts in a positive number, since you can't have negative grams. This is an example of what's called data sanitization, making sure that your program only uses so-called clean data that makes sense and fits the needs of the problem. So we set up a while loop with a conditional statement that basically says, keep looping this code while the value of grams of coffee is less than or equal to zero. That that way, if the user inputs a negative number for grams of coffee, the condition is true, the code will loop, and the user will be prompted again. The while loop will run as many times, or as few times, as it needs to. When the user inputs a positive number for grams of coffee, the condition becomes false, and the while loop will break, and we can proceed with the rest of the program. When we do know exactly how many times we want to repeat a chunk of code, while loops can do the job, but they also have some drawbacks. To see why, let's write up a while loop that counts up from one to five. You know, in case you want to make sure that all of your fingers are still there, or you want to keep track of how many coffees you've had. We start off by defining an integer variable named count, which we set equal to one outside of the while loop. The conditional statement of our while loop says that count must be less than six. Then inside of the curly brackets, we have code that increases the value of count every time the loop runs. Technically, this will do what we want, but to follow the logic of what happens to our count variable, we have to look in three different places in the code. That might be okay for a simple program, but for more complicated code, things could get really confusing and I really don't need to make my code even more of a hot mess. So this is where for loops come in. They make something as easy as counting to five even simpler by squeezing lots of information into a tidy little package. Kind of like how all of my hopes and dreams can be contained in one cup of coffee. Or two. Three. Let's look at a for loop that does the same thing as our while loop example. We start by writing for, followed by parentheses, with three key terms inside. First, we have our counter, or index initialization. This is where we first define our counting variable, rather than outside of the loop. For the sake of comparison, let's use an integer variable named count, which we set equal to, or initialize to, one. Next, we put a semicolon and write our conditional statement. Just like the while loop conditional statement, this says only loop over this code while count is less than six. 
Finally, we add another semicolon and give a statement that increments our counter every time the loop runs. This double plus notation simply means take my variable and add one to its value. Outside the parentheses of our for loop, we have curly brackets again. Just like with if statements and while loops, we put any code that should loop and execute while our condition is true. In this case, it's just a plain old print statement. Now the moment of truth. If we execute this code, sure enough, it prints out the numbers one to five like we wanted. Looking at the counting to five while loop and for loop side by side, there's a couple of things to take notice of here. First of all, the bits of code that were scattered outside and inside the while loop are organized in the for loop syntax. We can interpret the top line of our while loop as keep looping this code while the count variable is less than six. And we can interpret the top line of our for loop as for this count variable, which starts at one, keep looping this code while count is less than six. And every time the code loops, increase our count variable by one. That that's way more information built right into the loop's definition. Second of all, the code inside of the curly brackets of the while loop has the bit we want to repeat, and it has the code to update the variable in the conditional statement. Otherwise, the loop will just never break. But the code inside of the curly brackets of a for loop is just the bit we want to repeat on its own. We can swap this print statement out for anything we want to do exactly five times, like say printing out an address. But as great as for loops are, they aren't a one size fits all tool. For loops aren't as adaptable as while loops, so they're not a great choice when you don't know how many times your loop has to run, like in our coffee code from earlier. To see how to solve more complex problems with for loops, let's head over to Tamar. He's a phys ed teacher who organizes the after school five on five soccer club. Tamar organizes a round robin tournament each semester so every team of five kids plays every other team exactly once. But the number of teams always changes because a different number of players sign up. The number of games in each season depends on the number of teams in a specific mathematical way. For instance, if there are five teams total, then team one has to play the other four teams. Next, team two has to play the remaining three teams, excluding team one, which has already been counted. Then team three has to play the other two teams, and so on. So if there are five soccer teams in the tournament, the total number of games is one plus two plus three plus four, a total of 10 games. And that same pattern holds for any number of teams. Now, Tamar is a busy man and has plenty of other things to do, like helping teams come up with with cool names, or practicing his routine for his secret role as the school mascot. Go cauliflowers! So he wants to create a program to automatically calculate the number of games just from the number of people who sign up. And he recognizes that this repetitive, incremental addition is exactly the kind of thing a for loop does best. Pulling up his Java code editor, Tamar starts off with the trusty scanner to read in the value for an integer variable called number of players, which is the number of people that signed up to play. To get the number of teams, he uses an expression to divide his first variable by five, since it's five on five soccer. He also uses the floor function provided by Java's math class to drop the remainder, because we don't want a fraction of a team. Now, that doesn't mean that anyone gets excluded. Some teams will just have a sixth person and they'll take turns playing. But these kinds of assignments aren't the point of Tamar's program. All we need is the whole number of teams. So next, Tamar defines an integer variable called number of games, which he initially sets to zero, because this is what the program is going to add up for him. And now Tamar can write his for loop. Remember, for loops have three key parts in parentheses. First, Tamar sets up a counter initialization starting at one. Instead of a variable called count, like we used earlier, it's common in Java to name the counter with the letter i for index to keep things simple. Second, the condition in his loop says that it'll keep running while the counter variable is less than the number of teams. That way, his program will stop after the exact number of repetitions needed. And third, his incrementation will just be to increase i by one every iteration of the loop. After the for loop is set up, he has to write the code in the curly brackets, adding the value of his counter variable, i, to the total number of games each time his code loops. To check that everything's working, Tamar runs his program and inputs a value of 25 players, which he already knows makes five teams of five. And his code gives him 10 games as an answer, just like how he calculated the slow, non-computery way. But just to be totally sure that there's nothing to debug, he runs his code again, this time with a print statement that prints the number of games each time the loop runs. Sure enough, he sees that the sum first increases by one, then by two, and so on, as expected. And with that, he's got himself a neat little tool that'll help him schedule each semester's soccer games, no matter if 16 or 300 kids sign up for the club. 
Tamar solved his soccer game problem by harnessing the structured power of a for loop because he knew exactly how many times he wanted to loop the program. But he could have coded a solution with the flexible logic of a while loop, too. Or if he asked the math teacher for help, they might have said, what you're calculating is triangle numbers and there's an easy formula. You don't need a loop at all. The power of for loops is that they give repeatability in a way that's readable, traceable, and changeable in our code. And as you practice both kinds of loops, you'll get used to the differences, and they'll become a staple of your programming powers. By thoughtfully choosing tools every step of the way, we make things better for ourselves as programmers, and the better our programs turn out. If you're enjoying Study Hall Code and Programming for Beginners and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching, and see you next time!